Hey guys, this is John. All right, we are absolutely spoiled right now in the chess world. The U.S. Championship and the U.S. Women's Championship just concluded a couple days ago in St. Louis. Norway chess is going on with Magnus Carlsen and some of the best players in the world. And now we have the Ultimate Blitz Showdown, also in St. Louis, featuring none other than Garry Kasparov himself. Yes, that's right. The Beast from Baku, who's retired... I put that in air quotes because he's playing some exhibition matches uh, lately. You might remember his match against Nigel Short last year where he utterly trashed the Englishman. Uh, but none other than Garry Kasparov is playing in this event, along with Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru Nakamura, and Wesley So. Those are the top three finishers at the U.S. Championship, and they qualified for the right to play this Blitz showdown with Kasparov. So it's four players. Today was the first day of play. They played nine games each. It's 18 games total. And if we cruise on over to the St. Louis Chess Club webpage, you can see some of the details here. It's five-minute blitz with a three-second delay, which is a pretty interesting time control. And I think this is a great time control, actually. I don't remember having seen this before, but it has produced some enormously exciting games. And you can see the remaining nine rounds, so the second half of the tournament, is tomorrow, Friday, April 29th, starting about 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time. And there's $50,000 up for grabs. But more importantly, especially for the young guys, a.k.a. everyone other than Gary Kasparov, they have the chance to play a legend himself. Uh, Kasparov is considered by many to be the best player of all time. Uh, I don't know if I quite share that opinion, but he's definitely right up there in the conversation. And he's been showing that he can play some excellent chess still. And if we go to the current standings after nine rounds, you can see that Hikaru Nakamura and Wesley So both have five out of nine. But lurking right a half point behind is Gary Kasparov with four and a half uh, and Fabiano with three and a half. So there's not a huge gap between first place and last place. So I think that will leave everything up for grabs tomorrow when these guys play another nine games. So just for fun, I wanted to analyze one of the games that Kasparov played today because even though there's four people in this tournament, I gotta say, Kasparov, I agree with the commentators in St. Louis, he completely stole the show today. Everything is about him, and in a good way, that is. Uh, his play just sparkled, and he was showing some of his form that, you know, didn't make him look any different than uh, the way he played at his peak, really. There was the same level of energy, uh, the same inventiveness, the same type of pressure he was putting his opponents under. You could tell that he was a little bit rusty. He especially had some problems with the clock. But by and large, we saw the old Kasparov today, along with uh, everything that made him a great player and a world champion for uh, close to two decades. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this game he played against Fabiano Caruana in the last round. So this is, or ninth round, I should say. And he was white. They say don't analyze Blitz games, but I couldn't resist showing you guys one game. Uh, it was a Vienna game. And we're going to cruise right through the opening. This is an uncommon opening for Gary Kasparov's practice. So here he strikes with f4, getting into some King's Gambit sort of flavor, attacking Black's Pawn on e5. Caruana, very solid with e4, e5 with both colors. He really knows his stuff. And did I mention he just won the U.S. Championship? A couple days ago. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty much at the height of his powers right now. I hope that Caruana challenges Carlsen in the next cycle for the World Championship. I think he's the logical guy to do it, assuming that Magnus can get past Sergei Karyakin. So, all right, so Gary put the Black Knight in a pin here. Fabiano just trying to bring his pieces out. Bishop e6, Knight d4. Here, Gary played rook f1, so signaling that. His rook may be able to participate in the assault on the knight on f6. And Fabiano took on f3 with check. This turns out to be a mistake, and after which Black has a hard time holding the position together. I think it would have been best for him to play bishop g4 right here, putting white in a pin. The engines seem to like this move. But this is a blitz game. We're not going to worry too much about uh, possible improvements for both sides. So Fabiano took on f3. Gary retook with the queen. Bishop to d4. And now Kasparov, uh, true to his ways, decides to sacrifice a pawn. He plays knight e2, saying, go ahead, take the b pawn. And after bishop takes b2, rook b1, the bishop had to retreat. And Caruana decided to put it on a3, 
which you know he hated to do that, but if bishop e5, which is the only other safe square to go to, there is this d4 move crowding the bishop. And I don't think you want to be pawn hunting down here on h2. The bishop is probably not going to come back from that. So after bishop a3, Kasparov had a shot to win the bishop right away. And that was bishop takes e6, f takes e6, and now the nice move d4. Whereupon the queen on f3 takes a gander over that at that bishop on a3. And black is unable to play bishop b4 because a rook takes b4. So that would have won a piece. But Gary also played a strong move. He played knight f4, bringing about some pressure on the piece on e6. And allowing this check, bishop b4 check. Now after king e2, I think everyone watching this game uh, might have leapt out of their seat for a moment because they all thought the same thing. Doesn't black just have bishop g4 here, pinning the white queen to the king and seemingly winning material? Well, uh, Gary showed that he had that under control. So I'm going to give this as a puzzle to you guys. So white to move. How do you think the game should go? So try to predict Kasparov's next few moves. You can pause your video if you like. All right, so Gary came up with a nice sequence. Queen takes g4. Knight takes g4. Bishop takes d8, so regaining the queen. Rook takes d8. And now this is the move that he had to foresee at the end of this combination. And I don't know if Caruana missed it because his position was already kind of tough anyways. But knight to g6, lovely move. And the bishop on b3 shines. It's pinning this pawn on f7, so black is unable to capture the knight. And if black were to play rook e8, well, he's going to run into bishop takes f7 check, supported by the rook here on f1. That just wins material for white. So knight g6 was the sting at the end of this combination. Very like Kasparov to calculate a sharp line like that and have no fear with his, uh, his preceding play, right? Like putting the king on e2, not fearing bishop g4. He had it all worked out. So after all this happened, Gary uh, just had to go into conversion mode. So Caruana played bishop c5. White picked up an exchange. And I'm going to flick through the rest of the moves pretty quick until we get to the end game. He's bringing his rooks over, attacking the knight on f6. If the knight moves, that pawn on f7 is a goner. You'll notice that very soon Kasparov plays g4. And if black's not careful, this knight may get shifted if white ever gets a chance to play h4 and g5. So Caruana tries de desperately to counterattack. He ends up giving a pawn in the center, hoping to distract white a little bit, repositioning his bishop so as to block the advance of the h and the g pawns. But Kasparov, a former world champion, even though he's known for his attacking chess, it's not like his technique was ever bad either. So... Up in exchange, you would expect him to win this. It was devolving into a time scramble round about this point, though. I mentioned that Kasparov seemed to be having some trouble with the clock. Uh, you know, that's to be expected when he's like the oldest competitor by over 20 years, and he's also retired, <laughs> playing these young guns who are very active, especially in fast time controls. But he kept everything under control. Here he moves his A pawn. This is a good strategy. I like this move because... He can try to exchange it. This is a weak pawn for white. And he can try to exchange it for the pawn on b6 and try to create a target as well. You don't want to uh, linger with your weak pawns. If you can trade them off, then it's good to do so. If black were to take that pawn, well, white can play the rook over to a1 and he should be able to scoop it up easily. So knight g5 was played. And white just went to work. Kaspara bringing over... His rook to the b-file to attack. There was one moment coming up where it se things seemed to get a little out of hand for white. You can see that black took the pawn on h3. Now Caruana has a 3-1 to one majority on the king side. And this is the moment right here. So Caruana, with very little time left, played knight g5 check. If he had played rook to c7, then apparently it's about equal because black is attacking the bishop. And if that bishop moves, white would lose the pawn on c3 with check. So that was the one place where I saw that maybe Caruana could have climbed back in it. Uh, but instead of that, there was that knight g5 check move played. King g2. Here rook b4. And Kasparov once again started to assume control. He went over to attack the b-pawn. He did lose the g-pawn, whereupon we get a race-style position with black having a majority of pawns. Three pawns on the king side, whereas white has the C and the D pawns. 
This was a nice idea, rook b to a6. His idea is to play rook a7 and break black's blockade along the seventh rank. And even though Caruana was dogged in pushing those pawns on the king side, he soon has to come to grips with the fact that he's down material. And the rook here is attacking e7. If the bishop moves, he would lose f7. So Caruana got tied up. King f6 trying to defend the bishop. Bishop d5 making way for the c pawn. And the bishop on d5 is brilliantly placed because not only is it pressuring f7, but it also keeps an eye on the eventual queening square, h1. And Kasparov, I'm sure, has been in many of these race situations before. And that's not something that deserts you with age or rustiness, your understanding of uh, the dynamics of chess. And he did it better than no one, uh, better than anyone, that is, throughout his career. So he's got c6 in, and that pawn is simply too fast. Caruana had to soon give up his bishop for it. And this was uh, just, as they say, a matter of technique for Kasparov at this point. You can see that bishop returning to d5, controlling the h1 square. And he even sacrificed the exchange uh, at the end of this game because he knew that upon playing rook takes g6, here Caruana resigned, but had the game continued, he can just make his way over and win these pawns. And he's got his d-pawn remaining. The path of the black pawns is controlled by the bishop, defending g2 and h1. Game over. So I just love this, and I, I wanted to make a video about it because... Uh, I think you guys should tune in uh, anytime you can witness greatness again and a clash of the generations. You know, in sports, you don't really have this. Everyone asks, you know, uh, who's better between LeBron and Michael Jordan? I mean, we don't know because these guys never cross paths on the basketball court. I mean, choose any sport uh, and try to compare some of the greats and you just can't do it. They're different eras. But in chess, we actually can to some degree because... Gaspara is 53 years old, but he's still in there fighting with these young guns and has an even score after day one and possibly a very good chance to win the thing tomorrow if he plays with the same pizzazz he did today. So check out this event in St. Louis. Thanks to the St. Louis crew for putting on this event and Rex Sinkafield for his generosity. And I might try to analyze another game or two. We'll see how tomorrow shakes out. Anyways, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.